Hey everybody, Victor here. So, as you can tell by the title of the video, I want to talk about aggressive expansion. The reason I want to talk about aggressive expansion is quite simple. In my last video, somebody commented that they were looking for guides regarding a world conquest or a one faith. And here's the thing, I can make a world conquest guide based on the country that you are playing. That's fairly easy. But to make a general world conquest guide really involves explaining how all the mechanics of the game work. Because that's all a world conquest is. It's following the mechanics of how everything works to the logical extreme that is a world conquest, which is simply an endurance trial of boredom while you slowly punch the people that are lying on the ground for no other reason than you want to hit that milestone. So this is basically the first guide of many because I believe that if you're going to try and conquer the world, you must understand aggressive expansion. Period. Because if you don't understand it, you're going to be dying to coalitions before you conquer a continent, let alone the planet. So let's go ahead and get this started. I wanted to point out first, though, if you've seen other videos, I want to stress, the equation has changed that, and to be quite honest, some of other YouTubers have gotten this wrong, especially when it comes to religion. So, please look up the equation yourself if you want to, pay attention to this video, or simply go through the spreadsheet that I'm going to show you so you can read and compare notes, because it's changed. And some people are acting as if it followed the old rules, which it doesn't. So, be aware of that. But let's go ahead and get started. As you can see, just like with combat, you have a main equation that you start with, which is a feeder equation at the top, and then that feeds into a second equation, which is on the bottom. They all have a bunch of variables which seem like they should make sense, but there's going to be levels in here that I'm sure a lot of people don't catch. So let's go ahead and begin. So, the first one of these is development. Development actually has two options. You see, it is a province-based development or a country-based development. If it is province-based, which is whatever your goal is, the war goal, so if it's taking a province, retaking a core, whatever that happens to be, and it's province-based, then it's based off of the development of that province, and it is capped at 30 development. If, however, you're doing something nationwide, such as a subjugation, or a personal union, or forcing them to the HRE, or converting their religion, that is based on the total nation development, and it has no cap. So, two very different things to consider, and the easiest way I can explain this is if, a, with a hypothetical, let's say Paradox decided to release a DLC that for some reason decided to make the North American tribes develop one province miners that make them the size of modern day Manhattan. So 150 development in the 1500s. Let's just hypothetically say that happens. If you conquer them as a one province miner, that, because you're seizing a province, even if it's the whole country, would cap at 30 development. However, if you vassalize that one province miner with 150 development, you're paying the aggressive expansion of 150 development. So it's better to conquer them than vassalize. The next modifier in here, the next variable, is the peace term modifier. Now, I'm going to cover that in a bit, but I wanted to point out and stress that it is different than a CB modifier. So, it is going to be different than what you probably anticipate. I will get into it soon. AE Impact. This is what you guys would probably expect to be a modifier in aggressive expansion. This is the 20% in espionage, or 20% from being Kyria controller. That is where this goes. It just simply goes there. The next one, however, is administrative efficiency. You see, administrative efficiency not only reduces the overextension a province causes, it'll also decrease the amount of aggressive expansion you are taking, and it is, in fact, the reason why people say to wait till absolutism before you start taking out entire empires. Because you get 10% total from two different techs, then you can get some from national missions, such as Dithmarschen, Prussian, and Germany, all getting 5% permanently through missions, and then you also get them from some national ideas, but you also get it from absolutism or revolutionary zeal at a third per point. So simply by having 100% or 100 absolutism, you're reducing your aggressive expansion by a third. This is how you're able to take those massive empires, simply because 
while it is later on and they have more development and they're wider at the same time you can take more with them carrying less because your aggressive expansion is suppressed the last modifier i want to talk about here is the non-co-belligerent modifier so just to highlight what's going to come this non-co-belligerent modifier is the exact same as if you're fighting into the hre this is why you do not take non-co-belligerent non -co -belligerent land if you are going to do so i recommend doing it only in two circumstances one it is simply strategic or you cannot fight their allies directly unless you take this province or it'll make your life easier if you do and that development in the province has low development that's simple so if you are fighting france and they are allied to let's say spain but spain is also allied to austria and england so if you fight spain directly you're fighting a lot of people obviously that's not ideal however if you take that one province for spain you'll be able to release a vassal which at least means you'll be able to expand into them far easier than doing it otherwise then i understand but otherwise don't do it it's just not worth the increased aggressive expansion because that's slowing you down in your other expansion that you could be taking out of your primary target or simply in another war so let's move on to the other two modifiers here that, are, that I need to talk about in this equation. That is Peace Term Modifier and CB Modifier. Now the CB Modifier, I'm sure you guys are well aware of what that is. And they're the ones above the black bar. These are the ones you see on the War Declaration screen. The Conquest of 100%, Reconquest is 25, Imperialism and Holy War is 75. All of this pretty much makes sense to you guys. I'm sure there's one in here, however, most of you have rarely seen and it looks like it's not real. I will cover that one later, I promise, and it can be very useful if a little annoying to get to fire. Below the black bar is the peace term modifier. This is something that it is there depending on what your war goal is, and it changes things. So this is if you do not use that CB, or even if you do what it happens to be. So the easiest way I can explain this is, you know how you conquer a land, or you declare for a conquest war, which is 100%. However, if you vassalize them, it is lower aggressive expansion than simply conquering the entire country. This is why. Because you're getting the 100% of conquest, which applies, and all these other ones, if it does not directly apply to subjugation, which all of them do this, except for subjugation, which itself is 100% to do it, it applies the force vassalization down here of 50%. So you have 100% for the CB modifier, but only 50% here for the peace term modifier. This is why you're paying less. That simple. This is why if you force a personal union, it is substantially reduced because the, for the force union is 100% in the CB, but it's 10% otherwise this is this is effectively the difference you're not getting a reduction in aggressive expansion in some of them even cost or their captain cost however this is how you end up paying less aggressive expansion there is something here i need to note however and that is you need to read what these apply to imperialism here only takes for taking land so if you go and you try to force a vassal on somebody, it would not be CB modifier of 75%. It would be a CB modifier of 100% because imperialism does not apply to vassalizing. So it would be 100%, 50%. However, reconquest, if you read it, is to return all cores, but it'll also apply to your subject's cores. So this 25 here will also be replaced over here in the peace term modifier, not the 50%. Little weird, I know, but that's how it works. This is basically if you do not use the appropriate CB or that CB doesn't actually do any reductions such as subjugation, force union, etc. I hope that makes sense. If it still is a little confusing, let me know in a comment. I will try and explain it a bit easier or break it down further if necessary in the comments just so it's easier to understand because i understand this can be confusing in this 
because it doesn't look like it should be working that way. Let's go ahead and move on to the other equation though. And this is actually where I've seen other videos get it horribly wrong. They get it completely the opposite. Now religion, it does care about religion, obviously. But it does not care about your religion. And I'm going to assume you are the attacker in all of these situations. So let me give you a situation. If you are playing Austria and you are fighting the Ottoman Empire and you take land from them, it's going to care about the state religion and all religion is going to be state religion of the Ottomans, and it's going to care about the state religion of third parties, the people that are going to be gaining aggressive expansion against you, which includes the Ottomans, just not you. If they share the same religion, in other words, if they are also Sunni, you get plus 50% aggressive expansion with that country. If they are in the same religious group, but not the same religion, so let's say Karakunyu or Akoyunyu, which I believe is a Shia country, or Ajam, which is a Shia country, they will get zero. The reason why is, while they don't like you, they also don't like the Sunni, because they see them, both you and them, as enemies. So, but they don't like it that you're going into Muslim land, which is also what they think is their land. So they're kind of neutral about it. They're not happy, they're not mad. But then if they are in a completely different religious group of them, say Confucian, or Varayana, or Theravada, or they're a fetishist country, they care even less. They get minus 50%. This is why if you keep punching in to another religion, the other ones don't care, because they get a reduction if they're in a different religious group. The other modifier here, however, is the infidel modifier. And I think a lot of people get this one wrong too. The way the infidel modifier works is it cares about all three of your guys' religion. It cares about yours as the attacker, your def the defender, and the third party. And this is how this one works. Again, you're Austria, that means you're Catholic, and you're attacking Ottomans, which is Sunni. Now, it'll only apply to third party countries, or any country, not you, that is also Sunni. So it does not apply to Shia, it does not apply to a body or any other religious group, only to Sunni countries. Because you are a out of the religious group attacking into their specific religion, they take an additional 50%. So if you do the math, if you are attacking a Sunni country from outside the, the religious group, you're paying a double on the aggressive expansion. This is why that holy war is so vital when you do this or using another CB other than straight conquest. Simply because you are paying a massive amount of aggressive expansion that you wouldn't otherwise be taking simply by taking that land. This is why, if you haven't noticed, you can tend to take more European land as a European than you can as anybody else. And I've seen people make videos where it's Desvolt time because they get the equation wrong. The easiest way to understand this in game, in like canon, is simply the Crusades. The Middle East was not happy that they were being crusaded upon. They got quite angry for a good reason. It's applying here too. So hopefully that explains how religion works in this equation. Let's go ahead and move on to culture, HRE, and distance. Culture works similarly, but differently. Culture, it doesn't care about the primary culture of you, the attacker, but it cares about the, the culture of the province that you are taking. If you are taking a country, however, so you are subjugating a full country, or a personal union, or whatever like that, then it cares about the primary culture of that nation. It isn't going to break it up by the development of each province. It's going to consider the primary culture. What it's going to do is, if you are the same culture, the third party country, in other words, everybody but you, if you have the exact same culture, you will get plus 50. So a good example of this is if you take Lisbon, which is a Portuguese province, the two countries canonly that would have cared about that the most would be Portugal and Brazil. They were Portuguese. Most other countries might care, but those two for the most part. Then countries in the same culture group, so other Iberians, from Castile to Aragon to even Granada, will get plus 25%.
So you will still get that increase. And then if they're in a different culture group entirely, they get zero. No increase, no decrease, it's just zero. What this means is you need to focus down those individual culture group, that individual culture and then the culture group. And if you look at the culture map, you'll notice they're not massive most of the time, these cultures. Even Castile has multiple cultures in it. Take advantage of that. Because Castile, again, it cares about the culture in the province, but it cares about the primary culture of the country that it's getting the aggressive expansion to. Castile does not have the primary culture of some of their provinces, which means you can take it for less aggressive expansion with the country you're taking it from. Because some nations do not, some cultures do not have a nation to it. Target them if you can. Now let's talk about the HRE. The HRE modifier works if the province itself is in the HRE, and then it applies to any country that is in the HRE as a third country. So a good example of this, if you are Brandenburg and you attack the two provinces to your north that you wanted to buy, you're going to pay the HRE modifier on the aggressive expansion to take those two provinces, even though the Teutonic Order is not in the HRE. However, you are not going to get that increased expan uh, aggressive expansion modifier with the Teutons themselves, because they are not an HRE prince. The last bit here is distance. Now, the way it used to work, it cared about regions. So, if you were taking land in the North German region, the game would care. So, the other nations in the North German region will get increased aggressive expansion and then radiate outward. They've changed this. This is no longer how it works. The reason why is if you were on the edge or you took something on the edge of the region, for somebody on the other side of that region to care more than the direct neighbor to you made very little sense. It just did. So they made it to a linear, linear distance. Now there's not a map mode or a way to calculate that distance easily in the game, except for the colonial map, the colonial range map mode. So I put here a screenshot between Bruges, which is the teal tile on the coast, to Finisterre, that is 100 range. However, remember, this is colonial range, so it's going from Bruges into the coast, through the other coastal tiles, and then back into Finisterre. So it's a little longer than you might imagine, but this should hopefully give you an estimate. How distance works. It goes in multiples of 100, so 0, 1, 2, 3, and 400, and it caps at 400. The farther away you are, the less aggressive expansion you're going to be take, and it rounds down. So if you're at 99, it is 0. If you're at 101, it is 100. Might seem a little arbitrary, but it's how they did it. Here's the thing. Since it is capped at 400, Eastern Europe, for taking... Portuguese provinces will have the same aggressive expansion absent every other modifier as China would because it's capped at 400 and it gets rounded down to 400 so it will still be in there so do not think that just because they're further away than these guys they're still caring just as much and it will come up behind you if you're not careful so let's talk about the last three of these modifiers up here, which is Spy Network, Ally, and Subject. A lot of people I know understand that Spy Network is in this equation, but do not use it. What it basically does is it will give you a 10% discount on aggressive expansion for having whatever Spy Network you have. So if you have 10, it's 1% off. If you have 100, it's 10% off, which may not seem like a lot. However, if you're in the HRE, every bit of aggressive expansion is important. There's a few things I want to point out. You will not get caught with your spy before 25 spy network. So if you send the spy just to get that up there, you can get it up there to reduce the aggressive expansion. Two, it will help over time simply because even 5% may decrease the amount of years you have to spend waiting for it to decay. And that could be very useful, especially when you're reducing it with, say, Austria or Ming or any of the great powers that might be surrounding you that you cannot fight at the moment. 
So simply by making sure these are out there, you'll improve your odds of survival. Lastly, because you get a tech discount if you're behind tech than them of 5% per tech level you are behind if you have 100% spy network, if you're ever behind in tech, you should be spying on them anyway. So don't hold back, especially in multiplayer. Lastly, the ally modifier, it reduces it by a third. So they will eventually think you're a threat if you attack the wrong provinces, but it's not likely to happen anytime soon, and subjects have 10%, which just means you need to be wary of that, preventing you from having 190 when you intend to annex them, though usually you're going to get your aggressive expansion with them beforehand. So I want to go back to these CB modifiers. Now, as I said, I would cover it later. And for those of you that notice, it is this CB right here. I believe most people don't know this one exists simply because they never use support rebels. So let's go ahead and talk about what support rebels are. So whenever you have the spine network of, of at least 60, you're able to spend money to increase the rebel chance in another country. What this does is, if you ever look at actual rebels, it'll say they have this percentage 10, 15, 25, whatever it happens to be, chance every month to advance their cause to rebellion by 10%. Once they hit 100, they fire. You are basically, when you support rebels, adding another 10% to that. So as long as they have some unrest, it increases the likelihood they're going to fire. Now, the AI knows how to prevent this, so do players. However, if you simply prepare for it, so for example, getting into a war with the target and sitting on them until they have 20 war exhaustion and no more Diplo left to buy it down, you're able to peace out, take whatever you want, and then immediately support rebels. Here's the key. If you support some rebels like particularists, you're just going to be very annoying. However, if you support separatists, you also get a CB, regardless of rebel type, where you're able to declare war against that target to force them to accept the rebel demands. And with the way it works, especially with separatists, is once you do that, they will release that nation for every province those rebels have occupied, which means you simply let them occupy it. Here's the key. There's two things that it does. First, it's capped at 50 war score. Even if it's a thousand war score worth of land, it's 50 war score. If it's 10% of, of land, it's still 50 war score. So be sure you use this appropriately. The other thing is it's absolutely zero aggressive expansion. This means even if you are doing it to your own cores as separatists, they can still return the land to you completely free. If it is your subject's cores, it is still completely free. So you can use this, even in multiplayer, to simply make sure they break to you. And knowing that they are going to be breaking to these rebels at one point or another, because again, you've kind of wrecked their country, helps significantly. Or, again, if you're a multiplayer, you can have an ally come in and force those demands for you and then take a bunch of money. I've seen and done that myself. So, depends on what you want to do. I leave it to you guys to determine if you want to go with this strategy because, as others have pointed out, it can be unreliable. So, depends entirely on if you want to set up the time to do it. I next want to talk about coalitions. You see, coalitions require four countries. If, they're, if you're in a multiplayer game, it can be three. However, AI will not join it without four. That lack of truce, have less than zero opinion of you, so it must be negative, have at least 50 aggressive expansion with you, and they must pose a threat to you if they are united. What this means, if you are France and you own Western Europe, a three province, four, one province miners in Germany, they're not going to form a coalition. Because they're not going to stand any chance. But, if you are in a war with somebody that is your equal, or a alliance network that is your equal, they can then form and fire a coalition if for no other reason than they might actually get away with it. However, if you improve the AI's opinion of you, 250, they will then leave that coalition. And once they have under three members, 
which is why players can join at three, it will then dissolve. They cannot maintain with two or less. So make sure you go ahead and do that. And the only reason I'm saying that is I've seen three maintain, but not four. Here's the last bit. Aggressive expansion does tick down at a rate of two per year. Incre improved relations will help with that. But at this point, I wanted to show you an example with the Ottomans of what I'm talking about. And I have, sorry, I have other examples in here. I'll leave it up to you guys to come in here and look at them yourself. But this is what I'm talking about. If you are the Ottomans, if you look around, you have Sunni down south, first are Orthodox and then Catholic, you have Orthodox here and then Sunni, but then you have a bunch of Shia here. Now, if you look at the culture map mode, South and then Middle East are all one culture group. But most of Persia, where these Shia provinces are, are mainly in a totally different culture group. This Orthodox here is an entirely other culture group. The way this means, what this means is you can expand South and Persia is not going to care. Then you can expand into the the Caucasus and nobody else is going to care except for Europe which is in a different culture group entirely and there you're going to take out as well too so you have four very easy expansion paths and while down south they may want to form a coalition and Persia may want to form a coalition you can very easily dodge the coalitions by doing simple truce juggling so I wanted to explain briefly what that is and that is exactly how I just explained it. You simply attack down here, because wars take about five years for you to complete them, on average. However, truces last between five and 15. So when you start getting to the point where there's a truce that'll form down here, you make sure they will be under truce while you are fighting the Persians. And that they're both under truce while you're fighting the Europeans. And you simply bounce between them and the moment these in Europe start to form, you attack them before the truces elsewhere expire. That's it. That's all truce juggling is. May seem daunting, and it kind of is because you need to make sure you do not overrun your war. However, if you've won the war in the north, you can sit on it while you go then and fight somebody else to reset the truce timers. I have seen people ask how you would deal with war exhaustion you simply take ideas where the policy will give you monthly war exhaustion reduction. There you go. So let's talk briefly about ideas to help you with your ag uh, aggressive expansion and how to deal with that long term. There's a couple of options for you. You have espionage, which will reduce the aggressive expansion you get. It'll also help you form claims for subjects on the border of your empire where you can't reach. But then on the last one, you'll see the rebel support efficiency. This will make it so you, instead of it adding 10 every month to the chance that they'll increase by 10, it adds another 5. So it's up to you if you take this, but usually if you're going to be trying that support rebels, espionage is really good because they have a bunch of policies that increase this even more. But again, it can be unreliable. Then you have innovative and influence, which will also reduce the aggressive impact by 10%. Some people will recommend this more because if you're going with the right expansion path, which is reconquest early, influence will definitely help you with that. The other two options here are in case you are going with the decaying aggressive expansion option. This is humanist and diplomatic, which they themselves have a policy to increase to improve relations, which is a very nice thing to have. Between the two of them get together with the policy, you'll increase your improved relations by 75% meaning you'll be decaying your aggressive expansion 3.5 every year. Add in the province war score cost going down, the extra diplomats, having the diplomatic uh, relation in there, very nice thing to have, but humanist, if you're going for a world conquest of any kind, you want to have. The religious unity, national unrest, the tolerance, which will reduce unrest even more, the years of separatism, all makes it so you're more likely to be able to not have to deal with rebels. So a very good thing to have. So I wanted to talk briefly about a couple of final points just to reinforce them. When you are expanding, focus into specific religions and specific cultures first. So when you look at this Ottoman map, you don't go Egyptian and Bedouin and Mishrik. You focus down into the Mamluk land 
which goes through Syria, you take them out, and then you go into Egyptian. You don't also go into Bedouin, because you're going to be increasing their aggressive expansion just as much as everybody else. So focus your fire. Also focus into religious groups as much as possible, just to keep them all on separate war timers and separate truce timers. If you are expanding into a different religious group, using the right CB is huge, especially because you're taking that infidel penalty, which, again, can be massive. So find in here the easiest path for you. Usually it's the same as if you're in Europe and you're expanding in the HRE. Reconquest, or simply vassalizing them and expanding that way. It's up to you which is easier. Use, and I, I really want to reinforce that, use whichever is the lowest aggressive expansion path possible, especially in the early game when you have low reductions. Once you have absolutism, in the bank, reducing it, plus your other ideas, you can go ahead and start directly conquering land, and you can directly conquer a lot of it. But early game, the name of the game, is simply conquering through cores. This is why if you look at all the releasable countries out there, there are maps all over the internet, I'm sure you can find them, there are a lot of cores you can reconquer, making it substantially easier for you to do this. If you have the ability to use strong duchies, take it. As long as you have at least one subject, you get to maintain it, and it is a very, very strong policy to have, at least until you get to the point where you're not doing subjects and cores anymore. Do not take land from non co nations unless you have no alternative, or it's an easier strategic path for you to do it for the next war. And you can take the aggressive expansion. The biggest advice I can give you to make sure you don't have problems is to use imperialism, colonial provinces for colonialism, buying land and other trade networks through simply purchasing charter companies, whatever it happens to be, find a way to reach other areas. So Europe, Africa, Middle East, India, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, America, all of them, because you can expand in these areas for less war score and less aggressive expansion so you do not have coalitions building, but you're taking more land faster than if you were simply focused on Europe. Because all of Europe will unite against you if you even try. So spread out your wars. Get to different areas and fight them there. But here's the key thing here. You do need to slow down on your conquest, most of you, simply because... As long as they know about each other and they're coalitioning against you, they're in the same coalition. So Africa and Asia can be in the same coalition against you, which means you need to have armies everywhere. Lastly, as I said before, truces last 5 to 15 years. So be sure you tr truce rotate, and once you have the idea down, start doing it and fighting more at one time. For example, once you get through the Mamluks, you have Ethiopia south, further south here. You don't need to have a full army likely to take them out. So you can spread them to North Africa and Ethiopia. Once you're done with your, the Caucasus, you can fire north into, into Mos Muscovy and go that direction. Or you can go into Central Asia. It depends entirely upon what you want to do. Because if you go that route, Moscow is not likely to mind you that much. That's really all you need to do. Simply make sure you follow the right paths to the easiest expansion path. But I'm going to go ahead and leave this here. Hopefully this helps you guys play the game, just in general. Play the kind of game you want to play. And if you are looking at a World Conquest or One Faith, this makes it so you're within striking range. Just remember, there isn't really a time where you're just out of being able to even possibly do a World Conquest. Because it depends on your playstyle, it depends on a lot of factors. I don't know if you have much aggressive expansion, etc. And plus, if you're willing to do it, go ahead and give it a try. It's, again, an endurance run. Might as well go through it and go through it all the way. But that is entirely up to you. So I'm going to go ahead. If you guys like this kind of content, like and subscribe. Because I will be doing more of it. But first, I have another request to do an Akko Union Guide. I did see your comment, and I'm going to be trying to make that as well next. So, 
Let me know what you guys want to see in the comments, because I do want to know. But I thank you all for watching. Have a great day.